was a great presentation. That Renoko Rashidi was so good, and I can't wait to see him again. Okay? That's what we want you to say. And we want to thank the organizers of the program for having me and hosting me. And we'll turn it over to our brothers, and we can begin. There is really no necessity to turn it over to me. I was supposed to introduce Brother Rashidi, but all of you who are here know exactly who he is, right? Um, and so I don't have to say that. Let me just invite you to listen to him and ask him to present. Brother, I'm um, welcome. Thank you very much. All right, tonight's presentation. Tonight's presentation, as you can see, is going to be a visual presentation. And it's the first time I've done this presentation. And, you know, I'm really a perfectionist. I try to make it as close to perfect as possible. So we've been scrambling, I've been scrambling to get the photographs that I want to show you on this very important subject. And the subject, the theme is the African presence in the Arab world and the Arab presence in the African world. It's going to be very visual and it's going to be very topical. Now what I typically like to do is to begin by, um, first let's acknowledge my elders. I'm 64. Is anybody older than 64? Yeah. Enough of us. Bye-bye, <laughs> Manuel. Do you want to say anything? you want to comment? Um, yeah, all right. Uh, thank you. And um, as I just said, I mean, this is um, a joint collaboration between the Pan-African Society Committee Forum and the African Holistic Health Study Group, which I chair. And when we talk of holistic health, we don't just mean um, your tummy, your cancers, or but there are <coughs> serious issues as to our mental health because of what the oppressor has done to us. We have to try as much as possible to uh, decongest years of uh, negative stereotypes against uh, people of um, the African world. And the story is told that when the young man asked his grandfather, Papa, why is it that when grandma tells me the story about the lion and the hunter, the hunter always kills the lion. And the grandpa responded, as you all know, wait till the lion tells the story. <laughs> and Dr. Rafini is one of the people who has been telling our story. He's been doing that for a very long time. And he worked with six stalwarts, mm -hmm. as ancestors as uh, Jay Rogers, Ivor Van Setima, and a whole lot of John Henry Clark, a whole lot of other great historians who are no more here with us. And Dr. Rashidi tells a story about how J. Rogers told him that he's visited 60 countries documenting the African, African presence all over the world. And he made it a target to beat that number 60. <laughs> and as I understand it, he's now over 120. <laughs> <laughs> and we are very, very privileged to have, to have such an esteemed historian here with us today to reason with us. <coughs> Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Bob. Wonder if we can turn off just a few more lights. It's probably okay for you, yeah. but it's a bit difficult for me staring into those lights. And don't worry, most of us are in the darkness of all our lives anyway. <laughs> that's real dark. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other way. Huh? Yeah, it, it all goes. Yeah. All right, well, that might be difficult for people <laughs> coming in. So <laughs> we'll go back to where we were. Yeah. We'll just have to struggle. Okay. No, he, 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 no. Turn them back on. It's tough on my eyes, but I think if people are coming in, it'll be easier for them to find a seat. And I do expect 
<clears throat> people to come in late. I know it's shocking, but I've heard that in the UK, people tend to come, Africans tend to come late from time to time. So I know you, it's hard to believe, but that's, that's what I've heard. That's the rumor. Speaking of J.A. Rogers, this is the great Joel Augustus Rogers. And yes, when I heard he went to 60 countries, I figured I could do 65 because I live in different conditions. And I'm at 121 now. Now I'm going to speak, so we want to, this is the ancestor we can begin with. That's very good to acknowledge our elders, our ancestors. So I'm going to speak for about an hour, and it's going to be an entirely visual presentation. I'm going to take you around the world with me, and then uh, we can have a nice question and answer period, not speeches, questions, questions, and hopefully brief answers. And then there'll be plenty of time to sell the books and the DVDs. And I think a lot of you know I have a, a real hot new calendar called Queens of the Nile. And all of this stuff is very cheap. It's only 10 pounds. And Brother Emmanuel has books outside. So we'll go through it quickly, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully the photographs are not too garbled. That's my fear. Anyway, this is the great Rogers. Why would I have him up here? It's because Rogers is one of the African scholars that wrote about the African presence in the Arab world. Rogers was really my predecessor and that he used a lot of <coughs> visuals and you can find a lot of this documentation in two books in particular by Rogers. One is called Sex and Race. Yes. Rogers seemed to have an obsession <laughs> with what he would call race mixing. Yeah. Rogers is from Negro, Jamaica and he also wrote a series of short biographies in a book called World's Great Men of Color. Yeah. Before I go any further, I want—I don't even know my brother's name from Sierra Leone, but who went and got cables and patiently labored over here to make it right. Please stand, brother, and let, let us acknowledge you. Light again, so no, you can see. Light like to stand up, and we'll look at you in the dark. <laughs> it does take a village. You can't do this by yourself, no matter how brilliant you are, how talented you are, how strong you are. We need each other, even when we don't like each other even when we're mad at each other. Mm -hmm. We must find the capacity to work with each other, to live with each other again, to believe in each other, and trust each other, and love each other again. Yes. And that's the key. Okay, and, so this and that's is Brother right. Jalou, who just stood up. Thank you, my brother. We appreciate you. <laughs> now, this is another sister. I don't want to leave the sisters out. That's terrible. This is Mr. Scylla Dungy Houston. And she wrote a book called Wonderful Ethiopians in the Ancient Kushite Empire, published way back in 1926. And there's a whole section on the, Afri on the African presence in the Arab world. So her work should not be ignored. It's been reprinted. And then this is another important book that deals with the subject. This is The Cultural Unity of Black Africa by the great Sheikh Anta Job from Senegal. And in this book, he has three essential sections. One is the African presence in Africa itself. And then the other section is Europe, what he calls the Northern Cradle. Those Africans who wandered into Europe and got caught up in that ice and were transformed physically and psychologically. And then he has what's called the Zone of Confluence, where you have the mixture of the Southern Cradle of the African world and the Northern Cradle of the European world that produced what we call the Arab world. Now, one of the problems with this presentation is being able to define what is an Arab because there is no real concise definition. In the United States, we have what's called the one-drop rule. And the one-drop rule was developed by white folks in power to exclude African people from European institutions. So they said no matter how mixed you were, no matter how much European ancestry you might have, if you have one drop of African blood, you can't get in, okay? So different groups of African people have different concepts about race and ethnicity. Now what I've found in much of the world is that in the Arab world, for example, if you have any degree of Arab ancestry, even though you may be black as an ace of spades, even though you may be black as that speaker, though there, even though you may be black as a bucket of tar, and you speak Arabic and you have any Arab ancestry, you're considered Arab, or you can claim that. So different policies, different concepts that make it very confusing in terms of narrowing it down exactly what an Arab is. Does that make sense? And this is particularly problematic because the first people in what is called the Arab world were African people. Because we're the first people everywhere. 
Yeah. Humanity, this, this is basic now. This is African history 101. Mm -hmm. Africa is, let's be clear on this if nothing else, Africa is the birthplace of humanity. Yeah. There are not multiple birthplaces of humanity, there is only one. So you got a bunch of fools in the United States right now saying we're not African, we're Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. And that we don't come from Africa. Mm -hmm. And that the transatlantic slave trade has been exaggerated. I have no tolerance for clowns yeah, like that. Yeah, Here we are trying to, trying to build global African unity, and a bunch of fools are saying we're not African. I, I, don't, I can't tolerate that. Right. People say, Renoko, you need to get more patient in your old days. No, I'm less patient because I don't have time for idiocy and foolishness. And any black person who says I'm not an African, I mean, what are you going to say? After all this time, after Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X and Kwame Nkrumah, and you got a person saying in 2018, I'm black, but I'm not an African. Oh, my God. Here's a map of Africa, and you can see the extension in the east. Now, some of my Hebrew Israelite friends like to say that what we call the Middle East or Western Asia is really Northeast Africa. I don't understand that logic, because if you're going to use that, you can say at the same time that Africa is Southwest Asia. By the way, the question, I get this question quite a bit, and that is, Renoko Rashidi, what was the original name for Africa? What was the original name for the continent of Africa? So the question I have in response to that is, what makes you think African people, or ancient people in general, thought in terms of continents? The concept of continents is European. So we need to change our thinking in order to, to develop a degree of clarity. All right, let's go. I try not to do too much preaching tonight, but I feel like it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> now, these are two of the brothers who are very important to us in terms of uh, the African presence in the Arab world, how we see ourselves. This is the great Osatifo Kwame Nkrumah, and this is his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie. And this is at the founding of the Organization of African Unity in 1963. It was Nkrumah's dream to unite the whole of Africa, yes. uh, the whole of Africa. Now this is in Chroma, not the best photograph in the world. Um, that's one of the reasons I wanted the lights down a little more, because it would be sharper, but we're going to live with it. This is in Chroma and a progressive person, I would, I would say, from the Arab world. And this is Gamma Abdul Nasser. In fact, when Nkrumah was overthrown by the CIA, Nasser actually offered him sanctuary in Egypt. And Chroma married a woman from Egypt. And Nasser, in many ways, was more progressive even than the brother, Anwar Sadat. So Nasser is somebody that I have a lot of respect for. And he also, also another sister who spent time in Egypt was Shirley Graham Du Bois, the widow of W.B. Du Bois. All right. I'm getting it right. Now, if you want to talk about the African presence in the Arab world, you could easily start in Egypt. Because the official name for Egypt is the United Arab Republic. Okay, and most of the people who are in Egypt today, I would consider invaders. They are not the people who built these monuments. And if you go to Egypt, it never fails. I'm taking a group there in a week and a half. It'll be my 24th visit to Egypt. It never fails for somebody, a well-intended person, working in a hotel, a taxi driver, somebody <laughs> will say, well, since you're in Egypt, why don't you go to Africa too? As if there's a disconnection there. And black people in Egypt are treated with contempt. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're an African American, or if you're a black person from Britain, I assume, and you got one of those passports, you get a pass. Mm -hmm. But for sisters and brothers actually born in Africa, they don't have a free ride in Egypt. It's not fun for them. All right. And of course, you see these <coughs> monuments. In fact, one of the reasons I wanted to start with this is because a lot of people believe that Napoleon Bonaparte was responsible for shattering the face of Hormak at the Great Sphinx. That's a myth. This is done long before Napoleon was born. Get that out of your head and stop repeating nonsense. This was done by Arabs or by people or by Muslims at least hundreds and hundreds of years before Napoleon. All right. This is how most people, I think, envision the Great Sphinx or Hormak. This is the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. If you go to Vegas, don't go in there. <laughs> Don't lose your money. And this is a, um, an illustration of war market. This was done in 1738. And this is like 60 years before Napoleon. So you can see that this damage is ancient. It's not modern. And Napoleon, and I'm the last one to defend Napoleon, 
just got a bad rap. Here I am in South Sudan in a city called Juba at a university. Why am I showing this? Because these, these brothers consider themselves the people who have stood on the front line of the Arab invasions of Africa. I'm told I don't have to be particularly nice to the Arabs tonight, <laughs> that I don't have to be politically correct. I can just tell you what I think and what my experience has uh, given me. These brothers are adamant about that. In fact, I went over there and gave a lecture at the university, and I'm talking about Pan-Africanism, and their question was, where was Pan-Africanism when we were fighting the Arabs? <laughs> they say we are responsible for Islam not penetrating all the way into Central Africa. And they believe that very, very strongly. And I never quite got comfortable with these brothers, and that had nothing to do with it. I kept looking at them, and I was, and they asked me, Dr. Rashidi, is there a problem? What is wrong? I said, look, I'm jealous. I'm envious. They said, of what? I said, you guys, you guys are so black. I wish I was like that. And they said, come stay for about a thousand years, and you will look just like me. <laughs> this is Mansa Musa. Mansa Kankan Musa. Why is he here? from the Mali Empire because he went on the pilgrimage to Mecca. And Africans have been going on this pilgrimage, and, and by the way, I want to be very clear, this is not an attack on anybody's religion. And if I come across it that way, I apologize. I'm a disciple of Malcolm X when he said we come together, when we come together we put our religion in the closet. Because otherwise we will never <laughs> unite. I don't care what religion you practice. You can worship this bottle of water if you want to. What I care about is what you do. And if you ain't doing nothing, I don't have time for you, irrespective of your religion. One of the reasons I wanted to put this here is because this is how a lot of Africans ended up in the Arab world. A lot of Africans ended up in, uh, for example, Jerusalem today and Southwest Asia because they went in the Hajj and never returned back to the motherland. So you have very ancient black populations there. Okay. This is just a mosque that Mansa Musa uh, patronized. Here I am with a series of manuscripts called the Niger Manuscripts. Some of them are written in Arabic and some in Songhoi. These are found all over this region. The most famous ones are the Timbuktu Manuscripts. This is a sister, a young sister, in the Arab Gulf, or the Persian Gulf, if you like. This is a colleague of mine who teaches at a university in Abu Dhabi, who proudly calls herself an Arab. This is a brother similar in Sudan. He is, an, again, it's just mostly going to be photographs. This is a young child in Algeria, in northern Africa. This is a brother who is considered the father of chivalry, a dashing knight and poet. This is a photograph I took in the Medina in um, Damascus, Syria. This is Antara ibn Shaddad, or Antara the Lion. He is a dashing knight and poet. His father was an Arab, his mother was an Ethiopian. Arabs still tell stories about this man, I'm told, around their campfires at night. The Bedouin, at least, in the desert. This is 1,400 years ago. <coughs> this is before the advent of Islam. And he is a very important figure. He is a warrior. He led troops into battle victoriously. But he also wrote beautiful love poems to his wife. And so these are a series of images of Antar. This is a depiction of Antar leading Arabs into, into battle. Another one. And this is another one I took in the Medina in Damascus. God knows if it's even there now. When you consider what has happened in that part of the world. Now these two images right here are from an old anthropology book by a European scholar named Carlton Kuhn, who was an arch racist, who was a guy who thought that African people never really did anything in the world. And hopefully he's roasting in hell right now. Okay. He's got time to reflect on it. But in the, he came up with a good book, I must say. And I think I paid 50 cents for this book. I don't know how much that is in British currency, but it's not much. I found it in an old bookstore in a city I lived in in San Antonio, Texas. And Kuhn suggested, he used these photographs to say, this is what the first people in Arabia look like. And you have two different types. You have the brother on the one side with the short hair, who is probably similar to the Batwa, the 
so-called pygmies in Central Africa. And then you have another brother with curly hair who, is, who looks very similar to indigenous Australians. And he says these are the first people to inhabit what we now call Arabia. This is another ancient image. This is a depiction of Ishmael. Ishmael is, a, I think, considered the father of the Arabs. His mother's name is Hagar, who is a black woman from ancient Egypt. And this head is atop a tomb in the northern part of Saudi Arabia. You can see it there. This is from another book, and this is called A Black Arab. So it's again very confusing about the ethnicity of the Arabs. These images, these are, these are sisters and brothers. I met them in um, Cairo, in Giza actually, from um, Darfur in Sudan. Now a few years ago, a lot of us were raising hell about Darfur, about the images of the slaughter and massacre and rape of black women in Darfur. Now you didn't even hear anybody talking about it. From Darfur. They had just gotten married. They were on a honeymoon in Egypt. And these are people from Darfur itself. Until Sudan broke apart, until South Sudan succeeded, Sudan was the largest country in Africa. I think the full name is Balada Sudan, or the land of the blacks, from Darfur. Uh, a little tiny map of Iraq. We're going to Iraq now. And these are sisters and brothers in Iraq today. And they live in the southern part of Iraq, a place called Basra. What's going on there? What's that sound? It's a church. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little confused. <laughs> These are all sisters and brothers in Iraq. Now, how did black folk get there? You had different migrations. History is the movements of people. So what happened is that you have the enslavement of African people, capture of African people, particularly in this case from East Africa. And they are taken to various parts of the Arabian Peninsula, various parts of Southwest Asia, various parts of the Arab world. And the ones who were probably treated the harshest, or the, the most harshly, were taken to southern Iraq, where they worked in the, um, the marshes there. And their job was to take away the heavy concentrations of salt, or saltpeter, so that the marshy areas of southern uh, Iraq could be used for farming, for cultivation. And they were treated very harshly. And there were a lot of them. They are called the Zan, Z-A-N-J. And they engaged in three massive revolts from the 7th to the 9th century. The biggest revolt is called the Revolt of the Zanj. And it lasted from 868 to 883. This is the largest rebellion in history of enslaved people. Bigger than the Haitian Revolution. Bigger than the Revolt of Spartacus. And yet, very few of us know anything about it. It's written about in Persian texts, Iranian texts, and it's written about in Arab texts. Some of these Africans actually marched on Baghdad. Many of them were never defeated. The only reason they put down their arms is because they were offered amnesty. Arab armies from all over the so-called Middle East were brought to Iraq to put down this revolt. The revolt extended as far as Iran. And these are the descendants of those Africans. Some of them are Facebook friends of mine. And they talk about how they are treated harshly even today. The political rights that are denied them. And they are big fans of Barack Obama. <laughs> the reason for that is because when President Obama was elected in 2008, that sent hope to black people around the world. I've met sisters and brothers in Australia and various parts of the African world who talk about how inspired they were. Because they said if black folk in the United States with our legacy of enslavement could rise to that position, then they could too. Anyway, that's what they think. <laughs> Sorry, Doctor, what was the name? The Zanj, Z-A-N-J. And revolt is a revolt of the Zanj, or the revolt of the blacks. All you got to do is Google it. A lot of information will come up, including stuff that I've written myself on the subject. So there in southern Iraq, all these images, and these take us to Israel which could legitimately be called a part of the Arab world, too. Because Israel, as you know, is an artificial state that has been carved out of that part of Southwest Asia. 
And this is what the first people, at least people in <coughs> Israel, looked like 2,700 years ago. Now, next weekend, next Saturday, and next Sunday, I'm going to take groups on tours of the British Museum. Saturday, we're going to stay downstairs. Sunday, it's going to be upstairs. The tours start at 1045. I think the price is 12 pounds. And it's a fundraiser for Renoko Rashidi, who is doing this work, because he's not getting paid by Obama or Trump. Okay? So I need your support. And this is one of the pieces I'm going to show you. Look at that happy to be nappy hair. This is a black man in Israel 2,700 years ago. And these are black folk there today. Now these folk right here, these children, are actually from Ethiopia. They are Beta Israel, not Falasha. Falasha is like the N-word. Beta Israel. And they were airlifted from Ethiopia a number of years ago, and now they're in Israel having a hard time. <laughs> Wherever black folk are, we're on the bottom. I would imagine even in the UK, although I could be wrong. Right? They want to turn Black History Month into Diversity Month, I understand. And this is my brother Barack Obama greeting at the time Miss Israel. Yeah, that's a, that's a fine sister. I'm thinking Michelle had a word or two to share with the brother. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. In Jordan, and here I am with an African Palestinian, as you can see, a tall brother, although a lot of people are tall compared to me. His name is Raja Juma, and he is an African Palestinian now living in Jordan. Now he told me, and I get this from time to time, and I'm always a little skeptical. He says, I never experience racism, <laughs> that we don't have that in Jordan. He said he was only called the N-word one time in his life, and that was at a gas station in Miami, Florida. Okay. <clears throat> Good brother. And these are all people I met in Jordan. This is a black Bedouin who attempted on this little donkey, and the donkey gets smaller every time I tell the story. One of the days, the donkey's going to be like this. <laughs> more I tell the story, to take me up to a monastery, a tomb, in a place called Petra. Mm -hmm. Now, on the way up there, somebody, another Jordanian, or what I would call a white Jordanian, or an Arab Jordanian, saw me and this brother together, and told the brother, kind of laughingly, that must be your father, pointing to me. And this little brother was some kind of indignant. He says, no, no, he's not. And he was basically saying, I'm not black like him. <laughs> That was what he was trying to convey. These are brothers in Jordan. I never showed this picture before. And this is a new one too. So you can see there's a range of mixture among African people there. What is Richard Pryor doing in here? Because I wanted, yeah, because I wanted to compare him to the former Prime, Prime Minister of Kuwait. Give him some glasses and wrap his head. And there he is. Now, one thing that's interesting is that I said black people on the bottom, but I'm generalizing because black people also have risen to very high positions in this part of the world. This is, we're going to Libya now. And this is a brother who was born in Libya who became emperor of Rome. Of course, before we had these ethnic divisions, this is Septimius Severus, the African-born emperor of Rome, born in uh, Libya, I think, on April 9th, 146. And these are black folk in Libya today. Now, there are different kinds of black folk in Libya. There are black people like this brother, or this brother, these two brothers, who have been in Libya for a very long time. And then you have, and this is, I think, why I was asked to give this presentation. I could be wrong. And then you have Africans who are crossing through Libya and Algeria <coughs> and Morocco in order to get to Europe. And they are from what we call <coughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. And those are the ones who have been captured and being bought and sold. We would like to think that those stories were exaggerated, but Africans have always been treated harshly, well, I think, in the Arab world. Now this brother, and uh, these two brothers, the father and son, I had a chance to have extensive conversations with in Egypt. And there he is again. I said, you must have recently arrived, arrived in Libya. He says, oh no, we've been there for a very long time. And so you have ancient populations, you have indigenous populations, or populations that have been there for a very long time. 
And then you have Africans who have come relatively recently. And we can say that all over the world. Mauritania. Now that's a sad situation there. Mauritania is in the area called the Sahel. And you have Arabs, and then you have people who call themselves Moors, who are not like, I don't think, the Moors who sent civilization to Spain. And then you have, quote unquote, black Africans. And slavery was just abolished in Mauritania in either 1980 or 1982. And it still exists. There's a brother from the States, from Babylon, who wrote a book about it. A man named Samuel Cotton, the book is called Silent Terror. And you can get it, I mean, it's easy to get this information. And the world, for the most part, turns a blind eye to this. Morocco. Now, Morocco has been one of my favorite places to visit in Africa. And the reason for that is because Morocco also has a very large black population. And these people are called Berbers. And there are different groups of Berbers. Some of them are black Berbers, which just reminds me of a, another photograph I should have put in here. My goodness. These are Berbers. Here I am standing in front of the tomb of a great leader of black people from this part of the world who lived a thousand years ago, a man named Yusuf bin Tashmi. This is in Marrakesh. And this photograph is important because this, according to scientists, is what the first modern human beings look like. This is a reconstruction. And these bones were found in Morocco. This man would have lived 160,000 years ago. And he is a representation, an illustration of what the first humanity on earth looked like. Homo sapiens sapiens. Now what I could do if I had time is take you from region to region around the world and show you what DNA has allowed us to do in terms of reconstructing early forms of humanity or early people. As a matter of fact, until quite recently, you could have to ask the question, where do white people come from? Because for most of the history of the world, there were only black people. Now, I've asked everybody to turn their cell phones off and your video cameras off, please. Okay, There should only be two video cameras. Thank you. These are all folks from Morocco. These are the black Berbers. None of them are in positions of power in the Moroccan government. But you can see, it's just a painting, that they look like you and me. You could put that sister right here in the first row and think she was from Brixton, or Lambeth, or Tottenham, or wherever y'all live. I know because I talked to them. These are my pictures. Now, the sister here with the glasses is from Jamaica. checked, this brother was trying to make some extra money. In the restaurant. And we gave it to him. The last time I checked, I had between 950,000 and a million photographs. I keep telling Bob Emanuel I'd like to move here because of the research possibilities. And then I will show you guys every one of those photographs. He said, can we ever get rid of Renoko Rashidi? We're tired of pictures. All from Morocco. Now here we have a mixture. African Americans, Jamaicans, African Moroccans. Even I managed to get a new photograph. I try to do that every now and then. An artist, another painting. I thought they only had church on Sundays. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> Another artist. These are the magicians, I'm sorry, magicians, musicians called Ganawa. And the Ganawa, the people who um, play this music, originally came from Mali and Senegal. Hundreds of years ago, they were recruited as soldiers in the Moroccan armies particularly in a city called, uh, that's not one of the imperial cities. It'll come to me. And one of the, Meknes, Meknes, one of the cities in the north. 
you had an emperor there who recruited about 40,000 African soldiers as his imperial bodyguard. And they stayed there. And now the Ganawa play a kind of a religious spiritual music you may be familiar with. What I do when I take groups to Morocco is I take them up the sand dunes early in the morning around sunrise and give a lecture there. We can look out on the other side of and see Algeria. Ah, this is a photograph I thought I left because I'm always trying to promote black love. Black love is the greatest form of resistance to white supremacy. So don't be telling me you couldn't help what you fell in love with. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> and they wear all of this jewelry and they love to dance. Yeah, the pure black folks, they love to dance. They love to party. They love to have a good time. And I love hanging out with them. Now you, it looks almost like we are biologically related here. The Nuba in Sudan. And this is probably what the people who built ancient Egypt look like. These are the Nuba in Sudan. I'd like to come visit them, but the area is very unstable right now. You may have seen the images of these sisters dancing. So graceful. I'd like to go there. Not because of that. I'm old. <laughs> anyway, that's another conversation, too, for another time. <clears throat> Beautiful, statuesque people. <clears throat> Nubians. Now you have the Nuba, and then you have the Nubians. And the Nubians are people who live in the southern part of Egypt and the northern part of Sudan. <coughs> and they are also <laughs> oppressed. And they talk about when you get them to talk, when they feel a little free, they talk about the Arab domination from Cairo. And a lot of them are particularly angry because when the Aswan Dam was constructed, a lot of their <coughs> traditional homelands were flooded, and they've been mad ever since. Isn't she a sweet looking little chap? I really seriously thought about throwing her in the Nile River to see if she could swim. She looks sweet, but you're talking about a brat. I kept making fun of my bald head and making fun of my bow legs. <clears throat> if you go to Egypt, and many of you have, and you go down south into Aswan, these are the people that you're going to see. Very handsome brother. <clears throat> what about the African presence in the Arab world in terms of the field, the, the school of art called Orientalism? Now, Orientalism is, is my favorite school of art. And it developed late in the 18th century. It lasted for about 30 or 40 years. And you have European scholars who attempted to depict the people in what they call the Orient or the Arab world, not China. That's not what they meant when they talked about the Orient. They're talking about North Africa and Southwest Asia. And in many cases, the images show black people in a very um, dignified position. Let me show you a number of these photos. That's one of my favorites. And quite often you will see images of black servants in the harems. Oftentimes black people are portrayed as magicians, I'm sorry, musicians. Look at how well armed this brother is. This is just an image of Napoleon in front of the Ora Market. I'll go through these quickly. This is one of my favorites. This is a painting by Eugene Delacroix. This is in a museum in Paris. That's a nice one. This is in the, um, the Prado in Spain. <laughs> Let's. Quite often they show brothers as temple guards or harem guards. Now here's a brother obviously in a position of power and influence. And you see who the servant is in this case. This is a nice one. In fact, this is my favorite of them all. And I have a big copy of this in my studio in Los Angeles. 
I see some of the sisters are reacting to these. You can hear the mumbling and stuff. I wonder what it would be like if it was completely dark. You'd probably really let it all go. That's a nice one, too. I think this is in Paris also. Both of them side by side. Two good ones. That's nice. This is in New York City in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. All these are from the School of Art called Orientalism. Here's an interesting one. This is actually a slave market in Cairo. And you can see who the people are who are going to be sold and who is the auctioneer or the dealer. Now that is really a role reversal. This, I think, is in the National Gallery in Edinburgh, Scotland. I'm going to Edinburgh Monday and I hope to photograph it. That's a good one. One more. Showed that before. Forgive me if I duplicate them. Lots of these. These are from Oman. Now Oman is very pivotal here. And I'm going to spend time with Oman as I wrap up. But I had a chance to visit Oman. One of the things that travel does is it gives you supreme confidence. It's one thing to download something from the internet. It's one thing to do a Google search. But when you have been there and you've seen it for yourself, nobody can take that from you. It gives you a tremendous degree of confidence because you saw it. You didn't imagine it. It's not secondhand. Now these are black folk in Oman. One of my favorite <laughs> photographs. This is the Sultan of Oman. Not the current one, but the one before. So there's a lot of African ancestry there. Why is that? Because Oman was a destination of enslaved Africans. Taken from East Africa, particularly Zanzibar. And I'm going to finish with that part in just a moment. Oman, Oman. Look at the light face. They value light skin. So she's put all this powder on her face. I did a lecture day before yesterday in Dublin, Ireland. And everybody was from, I think with no exceptions, everybody was from the motherland. And they were all, we had a very interesting discussion. And they were talking about how today, so many people from the continent value light skin, light complexion. And that skin bleaching is a big deal. I understand it's like that in the Caribbean now. Maybe I'm wrong. Now we are, we're going in alphabetic order. We're in Palestine. I call these the invisible people. Because you seldom see them in the media. This is actually a freedom fighter who was convicted of terrorism. <coughs> Children at a refugee camp in Ramallah, Palestine. These are real people. Palestine. I took this from the cover of a Final Call newspaper in the United States. Okay, we showed that brother before. Uh -oh, I'm duplicating some of these, I apologize. This is just Renoka Rashidi looking cool in front of a mosque in Casablanca. Saudi Arabia. This is a high-ranking member of the government, another brother in Saudi Arabia. But it looks a bit like Patrice Lumumba. In a harem. There's that slave market scene again. Another slave market. This is from Somalia. Now, Somalia is in the Horn of Africa. I was there, actually, in Djibouti in May. And there's an identity issue there, too. Some people confuse being a Muslim with being an Arab. And some of the black people, darker than me, there are calling themselves Arabs. This is just Djibouti, Somalia. This is a, now tell me that sister doesn't look like, hey, my brother. 
Yes, sir. All right, this is my colleague here. Tell me that sister doesn't look like Michelle Obama. But she's a Sudanese sister at the border with Tunisia, but that's a Michelle Obama lookalike. In Syria, this is a mosque named after the great African Muslim Bilal. There is Bilal, a drawing of Bilal, on uh, calling the faithful to prayer. Who is Bilal? Bilal was a pure African who converted to Islam early on, who was tortured for his faith, who became a close companion to the prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Muhammad is supposed to have, the prophet is supposed to have told Bilal once, Bilal last night, I dreamed that I went to paradise. And I found that you have been there before me. That's a pretty powerful statement. Bilal is so significant, he's referred to as a third of the faith of Islam. And he's the first who hasn't, the first person to go into the minaret and call the faithful to prayer. Apparently he had a beautiful, beautiful voice. And lived to be old, like 90 or so. So this is Bilal. This is his tomb. And I actually went to his tomb, touched the tomb. So you have an ancient African presence in the Arab world. In fact, the, the ancestry of the Prophet Muhammad is, has been suggested to have had African blood. His grandfather was a Sharif of Mecca. He is supposed to have fathered ten sons and ten lords. They are described as black as a knight and magnificent. One of them is Abdallah, the father of the Prophet. This one takes us to Libya. That shouldn't even have been in there. This is a city founded by Septimius Severus. <clears throat> We're getting towards the end. These are black folk in Tunisia, especially southern Tunisia. So what we've tried to do is look at North Africa and Southwest Asia. Now, I've been to Tunisia, I think, four times. But on one of the occasions, I was actually able to go into the south, which is where the heavy concentration of black folk are. Apparently in northern Africa, the black populations are largely in the south, in the southern part of Morocco, the Nubians in Egypt in the south. Tunisia is no exception. I haven't been to Libya or Algeria, but I'm told it's the same. And the black folk in Tunisia have really had a hard time. Let me show you some of the images from Tunisia. Now, I went to the south, southern part of Tunisia on a fact-finding mission, and I found that most of the adults would not speak to me. They were afraid. They didn't know who I was. They did not want to talk about the racial oppression that they had been confronted with there. Okay. So the parents of this child would not let me photograph them, but they let me photograph their little boy. And this is one of my favorite pictures. The parents literally hid from me. This sister is from the south, but this photograph is taken at the ruins of Carthage in, uh, outside of um, Tunis. And she's a Muslim sister, and the reason she's looking like that is because I had just asked her for a date. <laughs> and obviously, we didn't go out that night. <laughs> That's a great photo. From the deep south, even better photograph. <clears throat> this brother wanted to know if I was a Barack Obama supporter. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, come here and give me a hug, man. Right. Now, this was the part of Tunisia I'll never forget. And this is a place called Kebeli. Kebeli is deep in the south in the Sahara. And I had to get somebody to drive me and the sister who was taking me around to this place. This is an ancient slave quarters. And Africans were marched from as far away as Mali and Senegal. 